We'll begin in about two minutes. Thanks for joining us this evening. We are live on Facebook. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. We look forward to a really fun discussion this evening on paddle craft, kayaks, and canoes. And I'm really looking forward to this webinar because our speaker is a very experienced sailor on the water and we're gonna have a great time uh, with him and uh, with his sea stories and tips and uh, boat building. So. Uh, let's get ready to start at uh, 1800 Pacific, which is going to be in about one minute. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth Coast Guard Tech Talks workshop. These workshops are jointly sponsored by the United States Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout program. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve as the chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host is Josh Gilliland, chair of the National Sea Scout Communication and Marketing Team. Josh will be coordinating your questions throughout the program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are normally held monthly on the fourth Tuesday of each month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, 1900 Mountain, and 1800 Pacific Time. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program. Next month's Tech Talks workshop will be on radar, which is ABLE Requirement 10 Foxtrot. Tonight's topic is paddle sports, kayaking, and canoeing. Our presenter is Dr. Don Goff, founder of the Auxiliary's Oxpad Program and longtime ship committeeman of ship 1942 in Alexandria, Virginia. Don grew up in Springfield, Illinois, where he earned his Eagle Scout. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Western Illinois University, a Master of Arts degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Telecommunications Engineering Management from Northwestern University. He's a 13-year veteran of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, where he serves as an instructor, watchstander, and boat crew coxswain. One last thing, we've muted all microphones to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you have questions, please uh, type them in the chat box. Josh will be monitoring the chat and we'll be sure to leave time to answer your question. So let's please welcome Don Goff. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, it's a very, very much a pleasure to be here tonight and to get to talk about my favorite subject, which is small boats. I've been hooked on these things since I was 11 years old when I first went to scout camp. Um, and being a retired professor, I always like to start these things off with a uh, pop quiz. Now, given the rules under COVID-19 for most schools, we can't actually grade this because uh, not everyone has equal access and bandwidth to do that. So the first question, and everyone can sort of keep track themselves, is how many people in the United States annually participate in a paddlecraft event? 
whether they go out in their own boat, they go to camp, uh, they rent one on a day cruise or something like that, but a canoe, a kayak, or a stand-up paddleboard. Is it 20 million? Is it 35 million? You can do the quick math, that's almost 10% of the population. Or is it 50 million? Okay, pencils down. The answer is 50 million Americans participate in some form of paddlecraft activity every year. And the numbers are going up because of the low cost of entry, because of relatively easy storage, no licensing or insurance uh, to purchase. And so uh, it, it, it has been popular and continues to be popular. Uh, okay. Now, what I wanna to do tonight is I wanna talk about uh, parts of, of these boats and I wanna talk about different configurations. If you're going to uh, take advantage of the opportunity to work on your quartermaster requirement and build a boat or lead in the construction of boats for your ship or for a troop or for some other group, um, then you need some basic nomenclature of the different parts um, and you'll make decisions about what kind of kit or boat you're going to build uh, based on the needs you have, because the hull configuration is going to vary based on whether you're on a whitewater river, whether you're uh, doing an ocean passage, uh, or whether you're just going to be putzing or fishing or something like that. So let's just talk about the basics here. This is a model of a, uh, of a sea kayak. And like all boats, in this particular case, it has a cockpit where the passenger, the human, will sit. Uh, it's relatively long related to its width or breadth. And so the intent is that when the paddler paddles, he's there, that paddler is going to be very efficient in going forward and getting the maximum value out of each, um, out of each stroke. Okay, because we always want to be efficient and, and minimize the amount of muscle we use and maximize the amount of value we get. So this is configured to that. We have a front called a bow, back called a stern like any other boat. We have freeboard on the side. The whole bottom part is called the hull and the top is the deck, simple enough. What you don't see in this model is a shear strake. A shear strake is a board that goes from bow to stern and basically provides rigidity to that hull on the outside. And also in the case of this particular boat, it provides a gluing and nailing surface to attach the deck to the hull. There's no external hull, uh, keel on the outside of the hull here, but if you look on this axis, you should be able to see that the hull is V-shaped and that this edge here, the chine, is pretty hard. That is, it's not rounded, it's not soft. This gives the boat stability when it tips and actually allows you to balance and have much greater uh, capacity uh, before you get to the point where you tip over. In contrast, one of these little river kayaks, and notice that the size of the cockpit to the size of the boat, the ratio of that is, is much more cockpit, uh, much less boat. It also has what's called rocker, which is to say a curve that goes up at the ends, okay? And the purpose of that is so that this boat will pivot easily. You can yaw uh, in it in order to avoid rocks or to avoid logs or to do whatever. And you're probably going to be going at a faster speed. And that sea kayak, uh, the average paddling tempo will be two and a half to four knots uh, in a boat, in a river kayak like this in white water, uh, you can easily get up to 12 to 15 knots based on the rate of flow of the water. So rocker is this arc and it's the ratio of the height from the cockpit down to the bottom of the hull. So this one has a lot of rocker. This one has almost no rocker. It's almost completely straight. So now let's start talking about canoes. When the Native Americans first started building canoes, they had a very simple process that they used. They put down stakes, two pair, in the shape of the boat they wanted to build. 
they cut and peeled saplings and they laced them to the, uh, to the frame to get the configuration they wanted. They then took sheets of bark, usually from a birch tree if they could get it, wrapped it around that framework and then laced it on. The lacing was made from tree roots, very fine, very strong spruce if they could get it. The last step was to melt pitch and make a kind of tar that would allow them to um, seal all the seams and all the gaps where the lacings went through. And then when that hardened, they had a relatively light, sturdy boat that they could use and they could make them uh, for a single paddler, two paddlers, up to 20 paddlers in giant war canoes that were 40 feet long. The problem with them is that they were relatively fragile because if you hit rocks with one, it would, uh, it would break uh, pretty easily or at least poke holes in the, in the uh, hide. But, uh, but at the same time, it was relatively quick and easy to repair. Just get another piece of birch bark, lace it in place, pitch it and move on. Now, uh, over time, we developed uh, more modern techniques for building canoes. And if you look carefully at this one, you'll see that on the inside, there are horizontal ribs, supports that go across it. It has all the other features. This one has external gunnels at the shear. The shear strake is on the outside and one on the inside. But then what happened, and this goes back to the 1880s, is those ribs, instead of being covered with birch bark and instead of lacing all that stuff together, um, they had iron, so they would use nails, uh, put them in, put a, a piece of iron behind it. And so when the nail went through the wood, it would clench like that. And then that clenched nail would hold the wood in place. So a rib, a thin layer of usually cedar, and then the outside coating was canvas that was stretched over uh, the canoe hull uh, and uh, was allowed to shrink into place and then was painted to make it waterproof. Uh, okay. So uh, in the Pacific Northwest, there was another type uh, that the Native American Haida could do out there. It was very similar to what Viking ships are. The Haida were able to get planks uh, split vertically out of cedar trees, and they used that to make lap straight canoes that were uh, seaworthy enough to take out in the Pacific Ocean. You can see the lap straight here where this overlaps, this overlaps this, and you can probably see it better from that angle. The difference between the Haida and the uh, and the Vikings though was that the Haida had no iron. So they had to lace all that together. And then after they laced it, they took the fine fibers from inside the cedar bark, tamped it in the, uh, in the gaps between the planks and then covered that with, uh, with pitch uh, the same way that the other canoes had been. So let us take a look at A quick a video that's going to last for about five minutes. Um, I can't find my. Where's the screen sharing thing? It's down at the bottom. Do you see a, a green thing that says share screen? No, that's why I'm asking. Well, I'll tell you I what, know. Don. I know. I, hang on, hang on. I got it. There it is. Don, you haven't um, enabled the computer uh, sa sound on that share screen dialog. Look at the bottom of that dialog. There is a box that says um, use computer sound. Got it, got it. And optimize screen sharing for video clips. Right. Okay. All right, we'll love. Uh...
which has rock striations from shore to shore. Can you see that? So uh, the yes. Right, let me slice the thing over against a bit of here. And I'll enlarge it. Let's take a look at this canoe and its basic features. You'll notice that it is uh, long and narrow. Uh, it has capacity for two paddlers. It's 16 feet long. And it's pretty typical of what you'd likely rent from a canoe livery if you were going to take a downriver canoe run. Um, it is made of a, of a material called Royal Lux. And basically what that is, is a layer of closed cell foam, about three quarters of an inch thick, with a harder plastic on either side of that to give it toughness or strength. Uh, this particular boat is used a lot on the Shenandoah River, which has rock striations from shore to shore. So it's uh, the Royal Lux provides some flexibility when the canoe goes over the rocks, the middle of the boat will actually rise and allow it to float over the rocks rather than getting hung up or, or breaking the way other materials might do. Uh, there are more modern plastics that have uh, less cell foam and more rigidity and more toughness. Uh, but this particular boat we've had for 30 years, and uh, it was used at the point we got it. So it's pretty rugged and, uh, and very lasting. If we go to the bow, we see that there's rise. Rise doesn't matter in terms of structural integrity of it. It's purely for aesthetics. The builders make it higher or lower based on whim and what they think looks better uh, or not. Okay. Also on the bow, look underneath here, and you'll see this material that's been added on. This is called a grunge pad. And basically what it is, is it's woven fiberglass that when it, before it's saturated with epoxy, looks like steel wool. And it allows the boat to absorb more wear when it's dragged. Hardly anyone doesn't drag a boat at one time or another uh, over rocks, sand, or around here, oyster beds, all of which will uh, tear up the, the hull pretty quickly. So the grunge pad extends the life. Of course, most of the time, the damage is on the stern because people tend to lift it up and drag it by themselves instead of having two people lift it. This boat originally came with wooden gunnels that came along here and there was wood inside and out, but the wood rotted after about six or eight years and so it's been replaced with these plastic gunnels. If you look closely, you'll see that they're put on with pop rivets. And this task was actually pretty simple. Uh, my middle son was about 10 years old when we decided to rehab the canoe. Uh, we got the gunnel set, as well as new seats, uh, and he put it on. We measured, drilled holes through, and used a pop rivet tool to put in those rivets. And this has now lasted uh, probably close to 25 years. It's a little discolored from sunlight and things like that, but much uh, longer lasting the plastic is than the original wood. The original wood port is still here. And that can be used to carry the boat over your shoulders. The seats have the original frames that was originally caned, like in the model. But the, uh, um, the caning rotted, and rather than replace it, uh, simply replaced it with parachute cord, wove it with parachute cord, which has proven quite tough, resilient, and very comfortable to sit on. The inside of the canoe is painted a buff color. You want a light color on the inside because that will reflect sun and not absorb heat, uh, which can be pretty tough out on the water over the course of a day or two or a week if you're on a long cruise. The outside color can be pretty much whatever you want. Most of these plastic boats come a color that's uh, printed in. The older boats, this particular one, has variously been yellow, red, and blue based on the availability of paint. So canoes are my first experience in boats. When I was 11 years old at scout camp, I passed the swimmer test, and they handed me a paddle, and they said, you and the other kid can go get a drum and aluminum canoe and take it down to the lake. 
We got on board, I got out on the lake, and I was transported. I became one of all of the voyageurs that ever were. I was with Lewis and Clark, Marquette and Joliet, and so on. And I still flash back to that every time I get in a canoe and paddle. Thanks. Okay. Any questions about basic canoe construction there? We've gone a long way since we uh, had the aluminum Grumman um, canoes that were popular in the 50s and 60s. Uh, World War II aircraft manufacturer that had to find a... Oops, excuse me. I have some uh, questions that have come in, but they have to do with uh, construction. So maybe we should hold those to uh, a little later. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Um, we have a question. Are there standard lengths to uh, a canoe? There's nothing actually standard. Most likely the canoes you're gonna get now are gonna be for one person or for two people. Uh, and they can, um, for some reason it does not want to show itself. Here I am. Um, so uh, usually the canoes that you're gonna buy commercially are gonna be about 16 feet long, occasionally a little bit longer. Um, you can also, though, get them 10 or 11 feet long if you want to get a solo canoe. Uh, there are online, available on YouTube, uh, a series of videos done by four uh, female combat veterans who uh, each took an Old Town single seat canoe and paddled from uh, Lake Itasca uh, in Minnesota, which is the origin of uh, Mississippi River, and uh, cruise those canoes together, camping overnight every night, uh, all the way down to the Delta in Louisiana, some whatever it is, 2,000 miles plus. Uh, so uh, single or, or long. Okay, uh, Skid has questions about um, a 40s rib canoe near finish and specific questions. Do you wanna put them in chat? Or how do we uh, unmute him? Oh. Sorry, let him put them in chat, and we'll deal. With you you have two more Q and three more Q and A sessions. On, on Facebook Messenger, that's fine too. You yeah. can email me or we can do it on Facebook. Fine either way. Okay. 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 All right, so um, let's shift over to kayaks now. Uh, as you no doubt know, the first kayaks were built by uh, other groups of Native Americans further north, the Inuit and Aleut, uh, and they essentially were wood framed as the canoes were, uh, but they were covered by hides uh, and they were decked rather than open on top. Uh, one of the things about them that's really interesting is that they're all laced together as well, and they're made from relatively small pieces of wood because above the tundra, above the tree line, getting a hold of wood is a very uh, hard thing to do. So when they were able to get wood, they would, uh, they would basically hoard it and amass it and keep it uh, and use it to make kayaks. We still have an opportunity to make a um, a skin on frame construction. And when we do it now, uh, all right, I'll come back to that question. All right now, the tendency is to make a wooden frame as in these pictures, and then instead of covering it with hide, covering it with canvas. Okay, so this makes a relatively light boat. And this is not a new technology. This actually goes back to the 1930s. And here are pictures of British Sea Scouts cruising in um, the kayaks that they made. Uh, small tidbit is that 
Uh, the British call these canoes, not kayaks, they don't use that word. And what we call canoes, they call Canadian canoes to differentiate them from these with the decks. So this is not a new thing to build skin on frame. Uh, in the 1970s, we started getting technologies that would allow us to build kayaks out of plastics and uh, other resin-based products. And then it was actually in the 1990s that these, um, that these wood and fiberglass boats started being made. The, uh, the original one, the guy who started Chesapeake Lightcraft was actually here in Arlington, Virginia. He and his wife had a one room apartment and he built all the prototypes for this in his living room. So this was very much a, a cottage industry that got started that way. All right, so uh, let's look at uh, two kayak videos now. The first one is on a sit on top and the second one is on a, um, a wood and, uh, and uh, fiberglass. Okay. Hang on, I gotta get to the right one. Got the sound on this time, Bruce. This is a sit on top kayak. This is one of the more recent things that have been added uh, to the inventory of available boats. As you can see, it's short and broader uh, than some of the other things we've looked at so far. Uh, and it's designed basically for relatively calm waters uh, and for a paddler who may be less skilled or heavier or older. Um, having said that, we have been on the Shenandoah River in the rapids, class one and class two, in these sit-on tops very comfortably. And several years ago, on an expedition we took with a group down the uh, Rio Grande River at Big Bend National Park, we had slightly longer versions of, of this boat and were able to carry our, all of our camping gear, our food, seven gallons of water apiece, um, and so on, tents, sleeping bags, uh, for a uh, three plus day trek. So they do have a lot of buoyancy and things like that. They're basically a simple construction. The way they're made is that a sheet of heated plastic is pulled over a mold and then the air is sucked out from underneath it so that the shape is vacuum formed. There's one mold for the bottom, one mold for the top, and then they're heat welded together. You'll also see that in order to give this some stability, the bottom is not simply rounded, it has all these grooves in order to provide some paddling stability, especially for novice paddlers. A normal paddler pulls to the right and the boat goes to the left and then paddles to the left and the boat goes to the right. So the effect is to yaw back and forth. By having those striations on there, it damps that down so that the paddler isn't going way to the left and way to the right each time, but can have some efficiency about going straight forward. It is fully equipped and for an advanced paddler, there are foot pegs in here that you can use to get pressure so that when you paddle and you have your full frame when you have your full frame you can do your torso rotations keep your feet straight and keep the boat going straight ahead but have maximum power so that's a lot of capability for a small boat and these are not particularly expensive. You can buy these a lot of places. Um, 
all of the sporting goods stores, places like Walmart, Kmart, um, Target. Uh, you can buy them at Tractor Supply, and this particular one came from Rural King. Uh, and these are substantially inexpensive, costing often less than $200. So the, uh, so the plastic boats are very prolific and the ones that are most common, uh, the ones that um, now we're gonna look at are the, uh, are the wooden fiberglass construction. Yeah, never mind. Keeps going to the next one automatically, my apologies. Share. Here's some. Share video. This is a 17 foot Chesapeake Lightcraft touring kayak uh, built out of Okume plywood covered with fiberglass and then, um, as you can see, with a bright finish over most of the boat. Uh, I've built three to this design, and these boats are extremely seaworthy. Um, and uh, in fact, this one I've taken out in the ocean swells off of Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, as you can see, it has the hard chine, which gives it a lot of stability in big water. You can see that it will tip and that chine will hold it at an angle of about like this. Uh, if I keep my body angled up uh, and I use my paddle for balance and a low brace, uh, it won't go over. So the design makes it very, very stable, very seaworthy, even in big water. The boat itself is rigged with grab loops so that it can be carried easily because the wood is somewhat fragile. Even though we do have brunch pads down here, uh, the uh, oyster beds uh, and the Atlantic seaboard will tend to cut this stuff to shreds very quickly. We also have grab loops. This shock cord is used to tie things down on deck, but the grab loops are here in case you go overboard, it gives you something to grab hold of. And notice that they are loose, not tight. That's to make it easier to grab and to hold on to if you or someone else is in the water you're trying to uh, you're trying to assist okay so here just behind the forward hatch and here just behind the cockpit there are bulkheads and the purpose of the bulkheads is to make the two ends watertight uh, and if the boat goes over water will go into the cockpit but that's relatively easy to bail out compared with trying to bail out the whole 17 foot length of the boat. The hatches are waterproof, flush, lashed down, and I also put in a triangular tube that's filled with air to displace so that less water gets in and to provide more positive buoyancy. You can do this with noodles, you can do this with uh, inflatable donuts, you can do it with the fancy ones like I have that are shaped specifically for it. But the bottom line is that uh, when you put the gear together for your kayak, you want to reduce the amount of possibility and places that water can, can gather. If you have a decked kayak that does not have bulkheads, and most of the commercially made ones do not, what they'll often have is a strut forward that's wrapped in foam so that meets minimum buoyancy requirements. But the whole front end, and maybe the whole thing, can fill with water if the boat capsizes. One of the risks to you as the paddler, if that happens, is the boat can go vertical in the water, which we call Cleopatra's Needle. All the water's in this end, all the air's in this end, and you, trying to swim around and climb back in, are wrestling with 
a bombing guru. Okay? So this also has hip pads to allow it to be rolled like any other kayak. It has a seat cushion. It has a back panel that I've taken out for now. And important to all of these boats, it has identification. If someone gets in the water uh, and law enforcement or the Coast Guard show up, they have to know whether someone was actually in that boat or whether simply it blew away. And if they don't have a number to call, there's no way for them to find out because these boats aren't registered like power boats and sailboats. Okay. There are numerous brands. There are alternative methods to this, what's called stitching glue. Uh, and uh, in the next video, we'll show you a little bit about strip built and stitch and blue technique. So, so far so good on the fourth. All right, now let's talk about the building techniques a little bit. If you're going to build from a kit or even from another design, uh, when you get it, excuse me just a minute. Okay. So you'll get building plans. And the building plans will show you in scale what the configuration of the boat is. You need to study these. These are your friends. You just start building and you don't really know how the pieces are going to go together. It gets much more difficult. They usually give you three or four pages. So they'll give lots of construction details. They'll show you the lines and the numbers. They'll often give you full size patterns. This is the pattern for making the hatch cover. And for making the seat and a few other things. So this usually comes with the kit. Also, you'll often get a list of the uh, materials that you'll need um, if if it's not complete as a kit. Uh, and uh, you will also probably get a tool list. Most of the time, the tool list for building a small boat is pretty simple. You need a hammer to hammer nails. Um, you need um, cheap brushes to use with fiberglass and other glues. And the thing you'll need most is you will need lots and lots of clamps, spring clamps and C clamps. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that there's packing tape over the jaws of this C-clamp. That's because the metal and the wood uh, can be glued together by epoxy. So the plastic keeps them from sticking together. So just a word to the wise, take the time and trouble to do that in advance um, and you won't uh, break the veneers on your plywood or otherwise uh, damage the boat. As I said in that previous video, uh, Chesapeake Lightcraft is around here. I built three of those. Pygmy is in the Pacific Northwest. Most of theirs are strip built. Uh, and the next video will show you the difference between the stitch and glue method and the strip building method. So bear with, and let's go to that one. screen share. In that case, you'll have long, narrow um, pieces of wood like this that are flexible. So it'll take the shape When you get ready to build your own uh, wooden kayak or canoe, you'll have a choice between two basic methods. The first is called strip built. In that case, you'll have long, narrow um, pieces of wood like this that are flexible. So it'll take the shape of the canoe or kayak. 
and you'll clamp them to the frame, paint them with glue, and then put another layer on and build that up until you've achieved the entire hull shape. Okay. When you do that, you'll have a choice between resorcinol glue, which is less expensive, it's a two-part that you mix with water, or you can use epoxy, in this case moss epoxy. Then you'll have to buy the resin and the hardener. The best known brand name is called West System. Uh, that was invented by the Goujon brothers about 45 years ago, and West is actually an acronym for Wood Epoxy Saturation Technique. Uh, it is the Cadillac, and it can be used for very high-end applications. America's Cup racing yachts have been built using their methods. Moss is somewhat less expensive, but in any event, the most important thing is to be safe when you're handling any of these glues. Absolutely must wear gloves because if you get that epoxy on your hands, you can glue your fingers together and it's difficult to get apart and it happens quickly. So always wear gloves. And these can be inexpensive vinyl gloves. They don't have to be nitrile, they don't have to be latex. Um, you can buy these at the discount stores for about seven dollars a hundred, so they're, they're very inexpensive. Now when you do a, the alternate method called a stitch and glue, the wood is going to only be about this thick, four millimeters. The keel will be six, so one layer thicker, but this is all you're working with in terms of the wood. Okay? And the way you're going to do the stitch and glue is you're going to join the hull at an angle and you're going to use epoxy and fiberglass to make the joint. Now to hold it together you're simply going to drill a hole every couple of inches and then lace it together, hence the term stitch. And in this case I'm just going to use zip ties because they're less expensive than some of the alternatives make a bigger hole. and that'll hold it in place while we glue it on the inside. After the epoxy cures, then what we'll do is we'll just trim this off on the outside and you'll have a little mark, uh, but you'll fill that with epoxy and sawdust so it doesn't show. So now we have our hull shape, so think of this as the chine, and we're going to mix epoxy, equal amounts of resin and hardener. The bottles are two different sizes so that the proportions come out the same, two to one. One, two, three, one, two, three. Then we're going to stir it up until it's uniform for about a minute. We'll use a throwaway brush, chip brush, and we'll wet the surface. Paint the whole inside. And now we're going to reinforce that joint with this fiberglass. Before we do that, 
we'll add just a little bit of wood flour to thicken the paste. Until it's about the consistency of peanut butter. So about like peanut butter. And then what we can do is one of two things. Uh, if we we're gonna do the whole long thing, we could just take a baggie, cut off the corner, and put it in there like a pastry, uh, like a pastry tube. In this case, we're just going to uh, paint it in place in the interest of time. This is called a fillet. We take the fiberglass. Set it in place. And wet it down until it becomes transparent. see the difference there between that going transparent and this which hasn't been painted and you can still see it clearly and just a little more And that's how the fiberglass becomes transparent on the outside of the boat. Of course, what you'll do is you'll uh, add several layers of epoxy. On the kayak that I showed you before, there are three layers of epoxy, and then that's followed by uh, eight layers of varnish, uh, all rubbed in between each coat. So those are some of the basics of the two different methods and kind of a fast and dirty uh, demonstration of uh, basic epoxy technique. Uh, any questions so far on any of the things we've covered? Sure. Um, we have a question. Uh, how much would it cost to build, say, the uh, seagoing kayak that you had there? The, um, the wooden sea kayak, this one full size, um, the current kit cost is about $800, and then you have to buy the epoxy on top of that. But the kit comes complete with uh, all of the deck hardware and uh, uh, the shock cord and all the rest of the things you need. So epoxy is the only other additional purchase. You can get um, kits uh, for a little less, and you can also get them for a lot more. But this particular one is, is currently about $800. Uh, I've seen this uh, kayak in person and it's really beautiful. How much time did it take you to uh, build it? Uh, the carpentry goes relatively quickly. Uh, it takes about eight days to do all of the carpentry. Okay, That uh, is assembling all of the, the panels in it. So there's a side panel and uh, two on the bottom. And I don't know if you noticed in the, uh, 
in the video, but there is a seam back here because the panels are eight feet long. So they have to be joined. So there's, uh, there's one here, one here, and then the other goes all the way to the front. Uh, so you have to do that first, and that takes a certain amount of work. Um, and then uh, at the end, you put the combing on around the cockpit, and that takes about 30 clamps to do that and wait for it to cure, because that's about uh, eight layers of the thin stuff built up. So um, you can do it um, uh, in a long week uh, or a week and a weekend um, and uh, or over a series of three weekends. The big constraint is that you have to wait for the epoxy to cure uh, between steps and building the process. And that actually gets to the next question. How long does it take for the epoxy to, to dry? Um, the short answer is it depends. It depends on the weather conditions. If you have um, hot weather like we've been having around here with the temperatures in the 90s, uh, it's a lot faster. Uh, if it's in the spring or fall when the temperature is down in the 50s or 60s, it takes a lot longer. On average, uh, we use these uh, epoxies that are slow cure. So they'll be dry to the touch or cured to the touch in about an hour. And then they'll be fully cured after about 24 hours. And does humidity affect the drying time? It's not drying, so it's not a factor. The, uh, the temperature is the factor. It's a curing process, a chemical process between the resin and the hardener. Um, would you feel comfortable in using that wooden kayak to do whitewater? Um, this particular one, one, not so much. And it would also depend on the configuration. I would not take that on the Shenandoah River, for example, where there are striated rocks that go all the way across the river in ledges. Um, because there'd just be no way that this would go over uh, without getting torn up and cut up. Uh, the plastic boats, not, not a problem, but the wooden kayak is somewhat limited. Having said that, I've taken it on the Potomac River where there are big rocks that I can steer around um, and, and uh, where there's a current uh, above the Great Falls. So uh, same water pressure, but different rock configuration is, is what really makes the difference on that. When we go on the when we go on the white water, we either take the canoe or we take the plastic. Sometimes, um, a lot of um, there are a lot of Sea Scout ships that are getting involved in paddling. What do you think uh, is the cost if they were going to go out and buy kayaks? What would your recommendation be for how they would go about that, and what could they expect to spend on that? Um, you can probably buy kayaks uh, like that sit on top I showed in the video uh, for under $200 a piece. And you can probably negotiate a discount rate if you buy many. Uh, you can also build your own. There are uh, project plans for things called the, the, uh, the six hour canoe and the weekend skiff, which is just basically a, a kayak with a flat bottom available uh, online or, uh, or otherwise that many scout troops and sea scout ships have used as group projects. And uh, each, uh, each scout has built his or her own boat. Um, and the unit cost uh, when they do that is um, uh, runs under $100 per boat. And with a couple, it called the six hour, but that's the assembly, the, doing the first parts of that you know, take more hours than that. But, but, the, uh, but the boats can be built and painted at very little cost out of three, out of four inch plywood and one by twos. We have a question. Do you varnish over fiberglass and or enamel paint? Well, once you've got enamel paint on there, you know, it doesn't do much good to, to varnish it anymore. The fiberglass uh, gets filled with epoxy and it gets sanded down so that the ridges created by the shape of the fiberglass bleed uh, are flattened out. And when that's all filled in, uh, then you start varnishing. And uh, the, what, you, what you saw in the video is eight coats uh, rubbed down with fine sandpaper in between each one. And by that, I mean a, about a 400 grit. Okay. And that's done with a, an orbital sander 
um, initially uh, on the epoxy because epoxy is hard, and then the 600 grit sandpaper on the, on the varnish. Um, the, the bottom paint on the one I showed you in the video is, uh, is a uh, marine two-part epoxy paint. And I put that on there because it doesn't show the scratches as much. Uh, when I first built the thing, I had it upside down in the basement and I was working on the bottom of it. And my wife referred to it as a 17 foot coffee table. So it gets a little frustrating when you see it get scratched up the first few times. After a while, you just sort of absorb it. Uh, we've answered the questions that we've received so far. Are there any other questions that people would like? There, there was one question about what to use to attach an uh, external keel to a uh, to a canvas covered canoe, and uh, it's a whole different order of magnitude. Uh, what I would suggest is use Sikaflex or something like that. If you use an epoxy to put that onto the canvas, uh, when that gets broken, cut up, or you want to pull it off, uh, then it'll it'll rip the canvas off with it. But the Sikaflex. Uh, is a little more forgiving um, so that when you take off the wood, you can, uh, you won't have to do as many repairs to the hull cover. Are there any other? If Sorry. anybody has any other questions, uh, you can re reach me through Messenger on uh, Facebook uh, or uh, email me. Um, any, anything like that. If you guys want to start a project, Obviously, everything depends on what your choices are, on what you want to build, how you're going to build it, and how much money you have to spend. But I'm happy to, you know, provide sort of free counseling. Um, and, uh, you know, my advice is obviously worth just what you pay for it. But I, I will offer that for free anyway. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, I think we're just about out of time, and I wanted to mention that... Uh, Oh, I think I think I'm interrupting Josh. Josh. No, no. Okay. Uh, next month's uh, talk is going to be on radar, uh, which is one of the um, uh, able advancement requirements, and uh, we're going to have a, a Coastie talking about that uh, for you, and they're all lined up and ready to go. Uh, and we also have a great speaker lined up for uh, October on uh, marine radio uh, procedures and, and that sort of thing. And we have uh, a specialist in that from the Coast Guard Auxiliary lined up and ready to go. So thank you very much, Don. This was a terrific presentation. Um, I've heard you speak many times in the past and you always have uh, rapt audiences. So uh, good job. And uh, I look forward to getting out on the, on the water with you. Excellent. So Don, Bruce, thank you for your time. Everyone, thank you for tuning in. More to follow and stay safe, everyone. Thank you for attending. Good night.